Hello everyone, Ross here. Just making a quick video. Um, hopefully the sound doesn't come out too muffled as I'm recording on my bed. Once again, yeah. So um, I'm just going to speak over a few things. Um, basically, one of the reasons why I'm going to become life, a life coach and what happened to me that I was going to make a video about. Okay, so basically, um, when I was on my way home from TAFE. Um, this is doing the train and he was having a panic attack. And I noticed he was having panic attacks because I used to do the same thing when I was in a similar frame of mind. And, you know, going back a few months to years there. Uh, I was going to speak to him on the train, give him some guidance. Uh, but my rational mind put it off. But God, being God always has a way of being, you know, getting things done. So I get off at the train station, then even get on the bus. Next minute he's on the same bus I mean. I saw myself in this man. And so I smiled at him and you know he felt comfortable with me. He so he then sat across from me, opposite me, on the other set of seats on the opposite side of the bus, but across from me so he could play, so he could see me. And yeah, one thing led to another. Um I asked him, you know, I said to him, yeah, you have panic attacks, so, and he's like, yeah, how did you know? And I was like, oh, see, I used to be in the same from the mind you were, I used to be exactly where you're at now, a couple of years ago, because he was a, he was dealing with, um, you know, I'm just going to say, he was dealing with schizophrenia and psychosis, so yeah. And you know we were talking, and I started guiding him through everything. We started talking about everything, you know, like how it's a result of trauma, and how it's a result of denying the trauma, or running away from the trauma, and that feeds it. Is that ah? Oh, speaking of which, um, sorry to jump the ADHD gun, but that's that comes in a lot with all my guru is telling me, because um, being an open channel, I pick up on a lot of people's energy and stuff, and it comes to a thought form sometimes. And he's like, Ross, you should. So my guru was like, yes, yeah, so this is a separate thing, so I might actually not do that. But um, he was like, Ross, you should accept what comes with you, because if you try and fight against it, the mind and it feeds it. So, but I was saying the same thing to this guy that I'd met about in the last Wednesday or something. And yeah, we we're guarding each other, we we're going through all of my life and everything, we just started talking about everything. And, you know, he couldn't, I told him, you know, how, you know, I'll do it. how I'm even, I was born psychic. I wasn't that, I used to suffer from substance abuse, you know, I went through psychosis, you know, I went through, um, had a brush with insanity, I went through that, um, then I went into a hole in my human journey. And he was like, yeah, like, if I was to pick you up, pick you out of everyone in this bus, he said to me, I would assume that you're the most normal one here. And so that's, you know, like a big part of um why I want to become a life coach and guide people, even though I'm I'm not even twenty one yet. Um, is because I have a big you know, I have a vast life experience. You know, I was born psychic, I struggled with that. You know, I was bullied tremendously as a child. Many of these memories are onset in trauma, and I overcame quite a bit of that, you know. Um, I suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder my whole life, pretty much. Um, yeah. I, I had issues with substance abuse, you know. Um, I've had, you know, even spiritual issues, um, even spiritual issues I've had too, um, with, with the money for gym possessions. So it's like, um, it's like, you know, when something attaches to you, and after a while it feeds off your energy. And after a while, once it's feeds off your energy, you can sort of, you know, you can sort of take hopes of you or something. So I've had issues with actual possessions. I, was, I know that sounds crazy, but you know, that's even a spiritual issue. Now, I've even had spiritual issues like that. But it's all part of me, my learning process and everything. And I've had issues with insanity and psychosis. And I've also had issues, you know, I've even experienced enlightenment. And I've even 
come out of all of that and become just normal again. You know. And so yeah, that's a big part of why I wanted to become a life coach. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And it's 4 a.m. and I've been up since 1 a.m. so I'm a bit tired. Yeah. That's pretty much all the reasons why I want to do what I want to do. I'm a life coach, guide people, and stuff like that. Like, even, um, like, at the moment I'm studying marketing and I've got some plans along to do with that, but that is even, you know, through my aspect of what I want to help build and guide people and stuff like that. Yeah. Also, I notice like one thing, like like right now, like I've got the flu, I've got a bit of like a head cold and everything, and I only ever get sick when I've been ignoring a part of myself or myself. Sickness comes from within, and it happens a lot when I deny myself or who I am within myself. So I get sick and I fall ill. I get diseased when I'm not sure within myself. When I'm not whole within myself. That's what I know. And it takes its toll on you. When I'm not sure within myself and I don't know my sense of self, it can take its toll on me physically, mentally, emotionally. In some ways, it can even take its own new sexually and spiritually too. Like it, can, like it can affect you in every sort of way. You know, when you're not, when you're sick, yeah, you know, when you're like not sure within yourself, you know, when you're denying your sense of who you are, it can take its own you anyway. Every in a lot of ways. And a lot of what I speak of, I don't just think it in my mind generally. I actually experience a lot of what I speak of. So when I tell people that the key to happiness is accepting and being sure within yourself, because acceptance is you being sure within yourself, that's it. You know, because we condition ourselves to deny who we are, deny our sense of self. And that leads us to become, you know, unhappy, you know. Happiness and fulfillment, all it really is, is just a sense of who we are within ourselves. It's just a sense of relevance. You know, it's a sense of us. You know, we're just looking for a sense of comfort. And we find comfort most within ourselves, within what we want to do. We know this instinctively, this is why we dream, this is why I spy, this is why we want to get somewhere and embarrass ourselves. But yet, we look to something else as a sense of self when we're right here. Even when we're dreaming and doing all that stuff, we're sort of projecting ourselves outside of ourselves and we're trying to keep up our emotional, physical, mental, sexual, and spiritual you know, needs, wants, or whatever, with this image. With this image we have in our head. That is not art. Yeah. <sighs> so, yeah. And, like, I speak of a lot of things energetically. Like, you know, from my experience energetically. And I've noticed it gets to the point where I experience things, I talk about it, but it sort of offends people because it's too bold or it's too in your face. I, I don't mean to be bold or in your face, but what I experience, I don't experience, like, when I, when I experience, that to me is my truth. That's how I learn. And that's how I'm, that's how I'm, I get set in my ways and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, I, oh, I just said that. So, yeah. 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 Anywho, I'll leave it.
leave it there. Uh, I'm just giving you guys something to ponder on. Much love, much light. And namaste. And remember, like I told the schizophrenic dude in the bus, uh, what I told everyone, and everyone you, even on Facebook and stuff like that. Acceptance is a key to happiness. Oh, yeah. And that, because your friend of dude is like, you know, we should, like, you know, people like us, and it's your friend of me and him, we have to learn to forget, we have to learn to forget. And I, the stopping his trust is like, no, you can never forget. But that would be to deny who you are. That would be to deny your sense of self, what you've been through, your pain, your trauma, your guilt, you know, this you seem to wanting to do something more or help others and stuff like that when you come out and stuff like that. And so like you denying it, you trying to forget it, actually feeds conflict and tension within yourself. You have to face it and accept it. And then by facing it and accept it and accepting it, you slowly it slowly loses its hold of you because you come to terms with it. And so as you can sort of view it for what it is as it is, as it's just happened, you know, it's a part of life. You can move on with your life and you can grow. You can find, like, you know, we lose a lot of our innocence. We lose a lot of ourselves. You know, a lot of our sense of being a kid as we grow older. I told him, you can be like that child again. Just happy all the time. When you come to accept it that you've been through. Yeah. When I first came into this whole healing thing with my guru, the first people I wanted to help out were in prisons and in mental institutions. That was the first people I wanted to help out. Because I didn't see them as too desensitized from reality. I saw them as too sensitive to reality. That's how I started to see it. These people weren't suffering from the fact that they're cold and they're calculating and they're work out what's going on. They're not suffering from the fact that they're too detached from reality. That's not the problem. The root of the problem is they're too traumatized from reality and thus start to deny it, deny their sense of who they are, their humanity, their sense of selves, that within themselves. You know, their human, their soul, their spirit, their heart. And when they do that, they lose sight of it. You know, they, they lose sight of themselves, it, whatever. Who they are. Who they are as human. And so then, they're not open to themselves, but rather they're open to all that is not self. You get me? This is where. So through deep depression, trauma, pain, you can open yourself up to things which are not necessarily benevolent and in your favour and in your image of God. You would open up to things. I don't make it all so I don't Christian on you, but you'd open up to things that would be all you know, that's anti human, anti divine, anti you know, positive stuff as demonic or devil, evil. Yeah, things that are void of feeling. Because you deny feeling. Your feeling is humanity. Having a good heart is being human. And being human is being compassionate. That is humanity. So you being in denial of your feeling of what you've been through, you've been denied in denial of your past because it's too painful. Which is too traumatic. You being in denial of that pain, which is what you feel, is being in denial of a sense of humanity, is being in denial of a sense of compassion, your sense of reality. So you lose touch with your sense of reality. Next thing you know, you'll be, you know, on heavy medication, or you've been in a mental institution, or you'll be in prison, or you'll have substance abuse issues. Or you might even take it out some other way, you might be a sociopath, or a you know, like a psychopath or something. Yeah. Or you might hurt people. 
you know, when I'd realised that these people were suffering the most, you know, and, and it's like, and it's, I think it's more of um, I could probably speak from a guy's perspective because I'm a guy. Now, women, I'm gonna touch on a lot of things now. Women complain that you know sometimes us guys just don't get it. Women experience things subjectively, they experience things through feeling and stuff like that. They don't like to be objectified because they can't relate to it, they can't really necessarily comprehend it. But men, we're conditioned to repress our feeling, to suppress it, and thus view things objectively for what they are. So women, they constantly process their emotions, they're constantly doing that sort of stuff. They're constantly, you know, giving themselves to feeling themselves who they are, feeling good. That's how they do all these little things and stuff like that. And they work stuff out. Like, you look at after a breakup, what happens? After a breakup, the woman takes weeks to cry straight away. After a breakup with a man, the man represses it, represses it, represses it for months, maybe years. And probably never actually emotionally processes it. One processes feeling and gets on with life and one represses it. Um yeah now for all I'm gonna talk about because I'm tired. But basically, yeah, like we're conditioned to repress our emotions, to suppress, to be so called, to be, you know, blocked off sort of thing. And you know, women, what I think a lot of women want is for us men to just live a little just be ourselves. They, they tell us all the time. What does it mean? Being yourself is letting go of all that you hold on to and being in tune with yourself. Knowing who you are. That's it. Yeah. It's not viewing things objectively. It's being in tune with feeling who you are. You know? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I said that or I typed this out better because I'm naturally a writing type of person. Also, I don't script my vids anymore. Um, I sort of, well, that's kind of on top of my phone because I'm not as anxious anymore. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, a lot of our issues come with what we're conditioned to come with our environment and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And, you know, as I told the guy, you know, schizophrenia during the bus, you can change everything about you. Through acceptance, because ex through acceptance you learn to let go of the past. You learn to let go of all that you hold on to. The past does not define you. Your past never defines you. What you choose to hold on to, what you cannot let go of, defines you. If that makes sense. Oh, wow. I said it way better on Facebook. No, no. I don't way better on my top <laughs> but yeah. Your past will never define you. The past that you choose to hold on to will define you. What you identify with, what you hold on to, defines who you are as a person. Because that's how people can relate to you through that sense of attachment, through your sense of attachment. Oh no, I'm thinking of a lot of things to that. Alright. Another thing is, um, I started for a couple of months now. I've been cutting emotional cords and energy cords. Some people are actually angry that I did that. No, I don't think I'm not sure if they're um, actually like thinking that or is it angry because they don't sense a connection with me. I, I'm not sure because I'm not connected with them. But um, as I started connecting energy to cords, um, it's very strange. I started feeling more. Alien to humanity and stuff like that. I don't even want to talk about it. But, yeah, oh yeah, that's right. But, because I didn't have any sense of attachment, even in, you could say, a of ego or something, um, I didn't retain any, like, I was, I'm, I was sane, very sane. I just didn't have any thoughts whatsoever. So I wasn't even necessarily one, I just didn't have any thoughts whatsoever. When I, when I went to see my guru, he would talk to me and he would be like, alright, now Ross, what did I just say? 
uh, could not retain any information because I have no sense of attachment. There's very trip now. And yeah, um, yeah, it's trippy. And no, I still don't have as much of a sense of attachment because I was more embodying that sense of self. And I started letting go a bit of my energy. Um, when I was embodying that more alien form, my, my energy was good, but now it's just going crap. Well, it's getting better again, but it's gone a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's always interesting. But I was just being. And uh, when my energy was positive, I wouldn't think at all, and I'd just be. I'd say I'd just be. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know what that was going to say, but inside of that. Yeah. But basically, because I didn't have a sense of attachment with anything, um, nothing defined me at all. Um, I didn't, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Oh, that's another thing. There's a difference between detachment, cutting emotional thoughts, and renunciation. Renunciation, you're not actually cutting the energetic cords. In renunciation, you're letting go of the sense of individuality. That's where people connect there, they can your individuality. So you're letting go of the sense of individuality and coming up to here, the sense of um, God. The individuality is it, like you reach out. So a lot of people, they eventually, it eventually connects and you reach out. So it's just section, it's like, oh, and that's another thing. When I started cutting those emotional and energetic cords, I did not have to work anywhere near as hard. I'm not getting to the point of your life, but I'm working on saying celibate. Because I wasn't connected anymore. Anyway. I didn't have that constant flow of energy, that exchange of energy. I didn't have people connecting with me energetically in any way. There's nothing interfering with my you know, my energetic system. There's no interaction. I felt like nothing. I feel like space. I'd be in a room full of people and I can relate to anyone. I'd just sit there and observe. And yeah, it was trippy. Yeah, nah, I'm trying to remember what I was gonna say. I can't remember what I was gonna say. Um Yeah. Yeah. Renunciation is different from cutting emotional cords. As an renunciation, you're, you're still keeping the connection, still keeping the energy of the other, still letting people connect with you, but you're accepting it. And you're not trying to define it. And so it's a constant flow of energy and stuff like that. And you're letting go of individuality, which is eventually what people connect to, that's why I said I'm sexual. And you're coming up to here, you're um, in your crown, and in your eighth chakra. Um, you've gone up to there. And so, People are connecting with you, and they're trying to pull you down constantly, and you're constantly going upwards and stuff like that. So that's that's very interesting. Very interesting. So you know when we renounce, why people are trying to connect with us all the time, trying to even reach out to us more, is because they feel like, oh, they just want to see us again, they want to see we are and stuff like that. We, we're, not, we're not defined by any. Because we're in, we're in a state of God realization, so yeah, I don't know, it's weird. I intellectualize too much. I shouldn't, I'm not sure if I should be posting that last part, but yeah, it, it's very interesting. Um, emotional cord and connectivity, and all that sort of stuff. It's very, it's all very interesting, yeah. Uh, okay, let's get on another thing since my mind is just. On an order, and I'm getting these things to say sort of clairvoyantly. Um, exercising is bringing consciousness, is bringing that sense of God to individuality, um, and that's more effective through the Western society, isn't it? So that's the Western form of enlightenment in some ways. And you know, even in the Western societies, and the more mystical Western societies, they start from the top and go down. So, yeah, it's more like an anointing, like in the Christian Gnosis, it's sort of like an anointing sort of a thing. They put their head in their thing and they anoint you and blah. So, so that's very interesting. And um, 
So when you exercise, this this key, key tip, um, breathe down the spine from the top of your head into your root chakra, into your body. But you, you probably want to close off after you do that because you're pulling energy in and that empowers the individuality and you'll feel more instead of taking 20 minutes to get that focus, get that energetic flow, get off my um, exercise and get that blank from one, you can achieve in two minutes. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. That's one thing. But you don't want to, you don't want to be like that all the time, you don't want to be open all the time. I'm not sure if I've paid, you know, being open in the past like all times, but you, you can't, it's not, Within to be open at all times of the time. You're going to eventually learn when I open and close. But don't do it too often. Just when, when I open, you know, channels, close channels, project out, and body back in, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, another thing is, um, Tantra is not like. It's not like, you know, you're having sex for long periods of time and that's not true. That's not anyone can have sex for a long period of time. I mean you can't get into it, I mean, even the guys is like it's all really bad technique and stuff like that. That's not Tantra. Tantra. The first thing about Tantra I mean it's a form of yoga, it's a form of meditation, it's a form of Mysticism and stuff like the first part of it, you know, is pretty much like working on yourself. That's the first part of tantra. It's not getting into sex. That's not the first part of tantra. The first part of tantra is accepting yourself. First part of it all is embodying who you are, accepting yourself, being there for yourself, getting that energy flowing. The second part is not to view things so objectively, so to let go of what you hold on to. And you know, all that you hold on to. Once you start doing that, you stop. You, you still feel sexually for people, you still have that sexual attraction. But it will be more innocent in some ways, it won't be so perverse. Um, you start noticing things like, um, I say, like, eventually, you know, when you're trying to ask about it, or whatever, you won't ejaculate out. Cause you know, rah, rah, rah. but you'll still have an orgasm and stuff like that. And if you need to, you definitely you, know, you can, but you won't as much. Um, so you could actually argue that you know, if you're still producing semen, you're not doing tantra at all. You could argue that because tantra is a big part of it, is you know, refining and conditioning your sexual energy to reach enlightenment. To be part of Tantra. So, yeah, you, know, you could argue that. But um, basically, um, it's letting go of the senses and sex is stop viewing things so objectively, finding that inner peace. Um, through the inner peace, through that silence, or through your breath, connecting with God. And it's sort of like you, you sort of breathe. Up the spine, but it's more just focusing on that inner peace, that inner serenity, that inner sense of God, rather than trying to focus on the process so much. And finding that sense of unity with your partner, watching the form, watching both your form and her form, or her form and his form, you know, disappear. Right? And Experiencing bliss, experiencing a high state of consciousness, going beyond the senses whilst you're in the most sensory, exhilarating, um, the most exciting, you know, as far as senses go, thing, and going beyond your senses. The challenge is not, you know, going off of their own senses, it's very fun, very disciplined. The is not something that just anyone can do. Yogis can do it. But a lot of people, you know, just because they've had sex for six hours, and they call that tantra. Not necessarily the case. A man who has perfected tantra doesn't view a woman sexually or objectively. He doesn't. He's not 
lusting after a body. He's not going gaga over a body. This is going to sound messed up, and I read this in a book. I read this in a book. Um, but basically, he views all women like he would view his mother. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, he feels like he's sleeping with his mother. No. He views women through a sense of innocence. He doesn't, um, he's not caught up in, you know, this or that. He's not, um, in some ways you could say he's not necessarily aroused. He may feel the sexual energies, he may feel, you know, getting hard and all that sort of stuff like that. But he's not, um, he may feel it and he may enjoy it. But he's not necessarily excited or taken away by it, if that makes sense. He's very disciplined, very focused. Yeah. So that was a big video and I've pretty much lost touch with it. Well, I don't know what I was talking about, but I kept a good steady flow for you guys. Um, if you're picking up the energy, it's a bit, um, I'm working on myself. Um, just getting down the basics again. I could always speed this up if I wanted to, do, but with all things spiritual, it's best to take your time. That's another thing, don't wash it. A lot of you guys, you know, you go straight on your third eye and your crown. I only wonder why a lot of people in your age have mental issues and stuff like that. First, open your heart. That's the first thing. The heart will teach you acceptance and patience. I know it sounds boring, but you will actually probably enjoy that acceptance and that patience more than you will trying to open your third eye and it won't open. If your heart's not open, all of this stuff is not really going to be open that much. Yeah, so, and even me, myself, the main thing I'm working on right now is my heart and acceptance and a bit of my lower chakras and stuff like that. So yeah, with all things spiritual, take your time to learn, to be. But when the time's roll and the energy builds up, you'll know when to speed up. Not now, not when you think you need to speed up, when you feel that your energy is getting up. It'll just speed up by itself, but you have to be impatient. Or you've been accepting. It'll just speed up all by itself. You won't need to rush anything. So take as much time as you need to. If you have a headache, if your energies aren't moving or whatever, don't meditate. Don't force it. That's another thing I've learned to do. Because I've gone through everything that I've been through. Um, I did for a while. Maybe have developed a bit of a god complex, where I thought that um I could that I could um dictate terms to what my body was naturally doing, like how the energies were flowing, the kundalini, universal energies. And I fried a lot of circuits. I harmed my body energetically from trying to think that I was in control. That was a big wake up what happened again and again and again and again and again. Yeah. I'm just glad that that like with all with all things it's not necessarily permanent but no, I'm just gonna take it easy and yeah. And I'm glad that you know we have all big girl and stuff like that. So yeah, with all things, take your time. You know, just be patient. That's what the heart chakra will teach you. And you'll enjoy eventually like you'll enjoy meditating on the heart chakra the most. And through the heart chakra, because the heart chakra when it opens up, it actually works on all the chakras. So it's probably one of the most advanced chakras. Um, you won't actually need to work on this one or that one or any of the other ones as much if you just work on the heart chakra properly. And also, um, what I'm learning is um, there's, a, there's a big difference between meditating and thinking you're meditating. So sitting there with your eyes closed, this focus on what spot isn't necessarily meditating. When you meditate, you have to tune in. That's a big thing I'm learning. So when I tune in, what I do is, this is what I do for me. I close my eyes and you've got that black space there. I go deeper and deeper and deeper into that black space. That's how I tune in. Me, that black space to me represents consciousness or like that sense of 
record or 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 and yeah change it change it change it and get deeper and deeper and deeper that's how you get deeper and conscious um also you'll see colors with that black space like right now I see a lot of blues and um now that I'm focusing on yeah well, I see a lot of blues um I see a lot of greens I see a lot of gold or yellow some purple sometimes sometimes I've seen orange and red um I I do I, yeah I do see them I do see red like that but I'm not sure I've really seen orange that much but I know I've seen I generally see blue. That tells you what sort of you're working on, or that tells you when you're tuning in right. So if you're looking at the heart chakra, you might see a bit of green there in that black space and stuff like that. That's just another thing. Um, in that black space, you might actually start seeing faces, or um, maybe if you tune in and off, there won't be black per se, it'll be more void. If we think of what is in black, or no, no, you'll get it. You'll get it if you see it properly. Um, yeah, but that's that's a whole different story. I don't even want to go into that. But yeah, basically that's when you're fully tuned in. Mm, so I just give you a hint there. And the easiest way to tune in, the best way to tune in is through the heart. <sighs> so I like I like, can't. Like for all these years, everyone's gone on, been going on about the third eye, third eye, third eye. Um, a lot of us can't even accept ourselves. I want to open up to everything else. We're in denial of self, and you know when you open up, you see a sense of self than all else. You want to open up to that, so you want to open up whilst you're in denial. That's madness. That's not spiritual. That's madness. Being spiritual is being more in tune with life. So first you have to accept yourself. And then you open up to all else and you start seeing yourself and all else because your sense of self is irrelevant. Um, so when you start seeing yourself and all else, you're accepting of it. That's spirituality. That's enlightenment. and that's genius. So the first thing you have to work on is accepting yourself. You know. Working on your lower chakras, working upwards, that sort of thing, and working on your heart the most. The heart is the best one you work on. And if you're in tune with your heart, um, a lot, because it's a lot to do with acceptance and patience and stuff like that, you'll accept everything around you, you'll accept your environment. Um, so your environment won't actually affect you as much. Just from working on your heart chakra. Um, yeah, a lot of things won't affect you as much. Past relationships and affect your point. Yeah, um, yeah. Habits won't affect you as much. Addictions won't affect you as much. Behaviors won't affect you as much. You will become more into yourself, and you will be able to change yourself who you are. You will become more like a child again. People ask me, how did I quit pot? Like it was a big part of my life. How did I quit alcohol? How did I quit cigarettes? I was a chain smoker, two packets a day. How did I quit cigarettes? Meditation. Then I would meditate on the heart track alone for about, at one point I was meditating on the heart track alone for about an hour a day. Eventually I condensed it to 20 minutes. And yeah, then I quit serious light. Because when you meditate, you open yourself to energy. And when you're doing that, you're, it's a meditation and yoga is after purification. Um, you're letting go of your attachments and all stuff. That's just not, you know, your emotional and mental attachment is also physical, so you're actually detoxing your body through meditation. The best form of detox I've ever had was through meditation and stuff like that. I would also say through pranayama, but I do not recommend pranayama to anyone. Because if you have any underlying mental instability, um, pranayama can draw it up the surface. Same with um, assuming some extreme lifestyles. Um, so like extreme diets and stuff like that. Um, that's another thing. Um, like we all bash milk and stuff like that. But when you see a schizophrenic or a mentally ill person or something like, that, what's the one thing they they drink the most? They'll be drinking chocolate milk and stuff like that. So milk or coffee, stuff with milk in it, or tea with milk in it, stuff with milk. It actually makes your mind feel relaxed and it makes your heart feel warm and stuff like that. It's a very mother nurturing energy. 
but I know this like this year especially whenever I was in suffering in the goal complex and prime my head a bit I got told you know drink milk for us because you know, the only thing I, I stopped doing was drinking milk I, I didn't drink milk for like two years or something and like Ross, you should drink some milk. I was like, well, should I don't know. Basically, it causes mucus in the body. And that mucus, it, co- it produces like a film in parts of your body. And it actually goes up to your brain and produces a film in your brain around the nerves and it coats the nerves, which sort of deaden the nerves a little bit and stops them from firing also erratically and stuff like that. And when you do things like pranayama, what are you doing? You're detoxing the the gunk, the film in your body. Um, when you get like a head cold and stuff like that, what are you doing? Your all the film and stuff like that's coming out of your body, all that mucus. It's all mucus that's coming out of your body, and what produces this mucus? But this mucus can actually help you to heal your body. At the same time, though, if there's too much in excess, it can do the opposite, and it can make you sick. It can deaden your body too much. So you gotta have a bit of a balance. My girl always says to me, "Oh, no, I tried. Oh, I was like, well, so milk is good for us." So, yes, but not too much. You shouldn't have milk every day. So, and yeah, I feel sick if I eat milk every day. Like some people, some people I know, once they've eaten, they're like a treat, like an ice cream and all that. Yeah, or you know, they'll have milkshakes or like you know, like um. Like Milo or something at night and stuff. Like that. And that's that's too much for me. Like, I feel I feel sick if I have that every day myself. That's myself. I like it every once in a while because you know, then it makes me feel good. Everything in balance. I find that that there's a lot of wisdom in the old ways of how we say emails and stuff. And stuff like that. Um, but yeah, like it's another thing is look up eat right for your blood type. Look up blood type diets because uh, that should help a lot. Um, me, my body, personally, like, has been at its best when it was more vegetarian in mind. But so I'm type A. Um, not going to get into it on Reese's and get all Reese's positive because that's not what's reason. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm a type A, and so my body naturally thrives with that. Carbs and veggies. And I've never actually, like, the one thing that my body has always craved is carbs, but I've never actually gained weight from carbs. What I, I've, I've gained weight in the last three and a half years. I went from 75, 80, 75, 85 to, um, over 130 kilos in the last three years because of my medication that I was on. But when I would gain weight, I would notice the spikes in my weight when I would have too much red meat and stuff like that. When I was in India and I actually didn't move around at all. At all. Like I was I was doing more exercise here in Perth. I wasn't losing as much weight at all. In India I was just sitting in a room all day meditating, not really moving, maybe going outside to connect with the plants and nature and stuff like that. That's another thing, um when you start getting into meditation and spirituality, a big part of it is getting back into nature. Don't just go out for a walk. Actually, touch the plants and for the plants. You notice, and if you can, and if you gender and stuff, your pineal gland will sort of fire, like you know, produce a bit of stuff, and you get you feel like you're in a state of meditation. It's from connecting with the plants, actually feeling connected with the plants or something. But yeah, I lost weight in India when I was just sitting on my ass. I lost about ten kilos in three months, sitting on my ass. No, no strenuous exercise at all. No actual exercise really. I was just walking in nature, came in nature, I was going to get walking in nature. I was right. And you know, so I lost 10 kilos in three months from being more vegetarian. And my ancestors were vegetarian. If I'm on one side. Um, but you gotta, when you get into diets, also do your research. And that's another thing I find like A, B, People like they would thrive some like a mix sort of a vegan diet or something. All the vegans I know pretty much are A B and yeah, so that's very interesting. Very, very interesting, very trippy. Yeah. And a lot of the O's that I know, the professor meat diet, you gotta eat meat and they, they 
get sick of too much carbs, they get sick of um, too much veggies. But it's me, I can't eat that much meat, I feel sick. But I can eat as many carbs and as many veggies and I know for full. Really, and it just keeps going through my system and I'll just keep I'll just keep shooting it out. Yeah, whereas the meat meat constipates me, but then a type O type person like my brother, he's a type O. He gets constipated from cars, but he judges meat very well. So it's very interesting. Yeah. But yeah, like with all things the diet, do your research and actually get into a diet. Or you know, but do your research into diets first. Like I was researching up on or I was reading about the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama is actually a non vegetarian. And you probably think, oh but he's a spiritual person of course he's vegetarian. In Tibet they don't they can't have that many um crops and stuff like that because it's a very weird weird climate. So they have to eat non animals and stuff like that. And you probably think, oh well, he's a hypocrite he produces that, you know, being he he produces that all this um Animal, pit, like you know, animal rights and stuff like that, and treating animals kind and stuff. Well, yes, but how, how, why should him eating meat affect that? Because, yeah, well, yeah, he he says like you know, try and be as sympathetic, try and be as compassionate as you can, no matter what in life. Even when you know eating animals and stuff like that. At least acknowledge that they suffered and stuff like that. That's what he says. You know. At least admit to it, you know, at least be sure within yourself, be right with yourself. The reason why he's non vegetarian, um, when he came to India in sixty five or something, um, he was a non vegetarian before, but then you know, he's like, Oh yeah, I'll go vegetarian now because he's in India. So he went on a vegetarian diet. Apparently he didn't do the diet properly, um but he he started suffering from hepatitis because he didn't do his diet properly. And he can suffer from illnesses, um, but, you know, hepatitis or jaundice or whatever, like his fingernails on all yellow. So, um, it says in the thing hepatitis, but yeah, he suffered from hepatitis from not having the right nutrients and the right things in his diet. You know, his people were acclimatized to more of a non vegetarian diet, and you know, his ancestors were really acclimatized to that. So he got sick from it. You see? So yeah, that, that's just something interesting to put out there. So when it comes to veget on diet, I see a lot of you guys talk about like, um, you know, you're gonna be vegetarian, you're gonna be um, vegan or something. It's not necessarily all those guys. Like you still see people getting sick and vegan, and still people getting sick and vegetarian. Get a balanced diet. Get all your nutrients. Get all your vitamins. That's important. Yeah. And if you're in tune with your body. Feel what your body needs, it will generally tell you what you need. Not what you want, but what you need, what you feel. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And just for you, meat out, meat eaters out there, because I know there's quite a lot of us who, you know, eat meat in the spiritual communities. Now, I'm not trying to bash any vegans or anything like that. Um, but actually this works for meat eaters as well. We all profess by our diets because it's what agrees with us most. It's what gives us the least tension. But we shouldn't have to project it on anyone. We should be happy within ourselves about it. Now a lot of people who I see are meat eaters, they they continue to be meat eaters because they get no problems with it. They can cope with it. They find that it agrees with them and they're in agreement with it. They're accepting of it. Um, a lot of people I find are vegan or vegetarian. They're in agreement with that. They're in accepting. They're in acceptance of that, and they flow with that. Yeah, and that's what agrees with them. We're all different. We're all not the same. No. If we were all the same, we would all be under one religion. We wouldn't have no sense of spirituality of God. Because our sense of spirituality on board is our personal experience, our personal validation, our personal feeling of something more. God is a personal thing, it is a sense of spirituality. Man has tried to define his sense of spirituality by, cold, by culturing religion, which is just an ego identification for something that is, doesn't exist in an ego. All 
religion is, is just a cultural identity surrounded by the one truth that is universal, that is spirituality. Much love, much light, and namaste.